Welcome to the Peter King Podcast. This is the pre-wildcard weekend edition podcast. And Miles Simmons, I may even call this the Mike Vrabel just ruined the continuity of our podcast podcast because Miles Simmons and I, my partner at NBC Sports for the Peter King podcast, recorded just a lovely podcast, an endless podcast, but a lovely podcast on Tuesday morning of pre-wildcard week. And of course, you had to know that about 1130 Eastern time on or maybe noon Eastern time on Tuesday, the news broke that Amy Adams Strunk, the controlling owner of the Tennessee Titans, has fired Mike Vrabel, which seems insane. And I think it is insane. But I think that this probably, Miles, was about more than just this one event or one lousy year. But let's just preview the podcast and then just understand that we're going to look a little bit different, at least I am, and it may sound a little bit different in the podcast because we don't have our regular equipment uh, as we sort of do a cut and paste edition of this podcast. We are going to have a full look at all of the coaching vacancies here at the top of the podcast. We're going to have a playoff preview. Miles Simmons and I are going to talk about our upstart teams, the teams that are a little bit down in the uh, seedings, who uh, teams that we like a little bit more than maybe Mr. Seeding does. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Then we're also going to talk about a few other things in our podcast. We're going to go dive deep into the Defensive Player of the Year Award, uh, which to me is the most difficult far and away award this year. We're going to talk about the New Orleans Saints and what on God's green earth happened at the end of that game to make the Saints and the Falcons, who hate each other anyway, now hate each other even more. And maybe even some people on the Saints hate other people on the Saints even more. We'll get into that. And we're also going to talk a little bit about my trip to Miami over the weekend and and what an odd football game that was and how never bet against Josh Allen. Anyway, Miles, thank you so much for adjusting your life to the whims of the coach firing season. And let me get your first reaction to the firing of Mike Vrabel and the fact that it appears to me that the Titans could have certainly gotten something in trade for Vrabel, but chose not to do it. I have my own theories on that. I'll open up the floor to you. You start and I will uh, throw in my two cents. Yeah, well, Peter, you know, you you said that it's kind of an insane move. And to me, the only way that this makes sense is if there were some sort of power struggle between, you know, whether it's ownership, Mike Vrabel, or then also, you know, you have GM Rand Carthon and perhaps he and Amy Adams Strunk decided that they wanted to go in a specific direction with the way that the team works. And Mike Vrabel, for whatever reason, does not fit into the mold of who they want as head coach of that football team. And it doesn't really make sense. You know, this is somebody in Mike Vrabel who was AP coach of the year two years ago. You know, he took over that Titans team. And they went to the AFC championship game in 2019 after switching to Ryan Tannehill as quarterback over Marcus Mariota and Ryan Tannehill, you know, and yes, he's not playing at this level anymore, certainly, but he was playing at an MVP level in 2019 once he took over as quarterback. You know, you've got a team that was still extremely motivated and you could tell through the latter half of this season, even though things were not going well for them, right? They went down to Miami and beat Miami really soundly, I thought. You know, it wasn't just that, yeah, they had to exer- they had to execute that comeback, but they really dominated Miami physically in that game. And that's why they were able to win it at the end. All right? You look at what they did against Jacksonville in the last game of the season, nothing to really play for. 
But Derrick Henry goes out and he runs like a house of fire. You know, you still have this team playing at a really high level with really high effort, I guess I should really say, throughout the course of the year. And what more do you want from a coach than that? I mean, yeah, I know he's not going to be the biggest offensive innovator he's not Mm -hmm. of the Shanahan like Sean McVay you know that kind Mike McDaniel that kind of mold that's not who he is but this is somebody who can coach the hell out of a football team and I think that somebody in this coaching cycle is going to be very very happy that Mike Vrabel is now available with no strings attached because they're gonna get a really 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 good hire and for Tennessee I don't really know how you're going to be able to get a head coach that is better today than Mike Vrabel. Yeah, I I think this has to do with philosophy. And Amy Adams Strunk believes in a collaborative philosophy. That's one of the reasons why she hired a general manager from the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Miles, let's understand exactly what that meant. I I think clearly what it meant was that uh, she wanted a more traditional structure of how to run a team with a strong general manager, an influential general manager, and uh, a head coach who could work with the general manager. And I think in the last... 24 months, Amy Adams Strunk has become, if not convinced, she thinks that Mike Vrabel probably wants more of a significant role in the organization. It started when Vrabel clearly did not approve of the trade of A.J. Brown uh, to the Philadelphia Eagles. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that goes with that specific story. And one of the things is, you remember the video from that night when the trade was announced, Vrabel clearly couldn't hide his disgust. Yeah. And I think there's part of this, honestly, where Mike Vrabel thinks, I'm not sure I want to work for a team that every time a player gets really good, we don't pay him. Mm -hmm. And that is what has happened. And, And Miles, you saw on Sunday... When Derrick Henry said goodbye to the crowd, well, I think we all sort of thought, and look, who knows, maybe it's not goodbye. It sure seemed like it was goodbye. That's what it sounded like. And we're all saying to ourselves, I said to myself, you know, this is a little bit crazy because even though Derrick Henry has just turned 30 years old, he just broke a 69-yard run against a team that was playing for its playoff lives And on that 69-yard run, he had the seventh fastest time of any ball carrier, running back or receiver, all season in the NFL. This is a 247-pound man. And all of a sudden, we're to think, oh, he's not good anymore. Are you crazy? This guy still is real good. There are some people whose internal body clocks and, and all that uh, you know, he might be 30 years old, but he certainly didn't play this year like a 30 year old, didn't look like a 30 year old on Sunday. And so and yet he's saying goodbye to the organization. What does that say to you? It's that he's already been told we're not going to pay you a competitive rate, you know, on the market. So I I think if I'm Mike Vrabel, I want out because I know that. I know that I've got a good chance of getting a very good job on this market. And look, Miles, we'll get into all of these guys here in a moment. But all of a sudden, when you look at the coaching market, and I don't know whether Bill Belichick breaks free or not, but all of a sudden you look at the coaching market and you've got Mike Vrabel, perhaps Bill Belichick, and Jim Harbaugh on it. That is one of the best free agent coaching markets. And you might have Mike Tomlin. I doubt it, but you might. That's going to be one of the best free agent coaching markets, or at least one of the best markets for every TV network in America to go chasing uh, chasing successful coaches who maybe want to take a year off or maybe just want out. 
But I, I think, although the shock of this, I, I mean, here's a here's a guy, Mike Vrabel, who uh, has won 56 games in six years at a small market franchise. And yeah, he's won, gone 13 and 24, or I'm sorry, 13 and 21 the last two years. So that's not good. But, you know, he's a great coach. And in my opinion, he will not have any trouble finding a job. Just my I, thought. I, I don't think he should have any trouble finding a job. I mean, this, this is one of those situations where, you know, and, and I use the word power struggle, and I don't necessarily know if that was the right phrase to you, but like it, it's sometimes when you have different philosophies, right? Then that's where you can say, all right, this isn't going to work because there are people, and I've experienced this in my professional life, I'm sure, you know, over your storied career, Peter, you have too, where look, you have a boss and an employee, right? Or, or two people who have to work together and they don't work well together. And like, it's nobody's fault. It's just, you are not necessarily going to jive philosophically with the other person. And so maybe that's what happened here and it became an untenable situation. But I think when you're talking about desirable head coaches right now, today, and you mentioned, you know, Bill Belichick, Jim Harbaugh, obviously we know those guys are potentially on the market right now, especially with what's going on with New England. And maybe we'll have to, you know, break into our day again, Peter, and do another podcast with Bill Belichick if something happens, knock on wood. But of the three that we're talking about right now, I would want Mike Vrabel. And I want Mike Vrabel because I feel like he's more about what's next than what has been, right? Harbaugh, while I also would not mind hiring him, like that's somebody who has not had the success in the NFL for over a decade now, right? That that Super Bowl was in 2012. Also right? somebody who's probably going to leave a trail of destruction in his path, but... Also potentially yeah. true. <laughs> yes. And also with Belichick, I mean, you're talking about a septuagenarian and the success has not been there since 2018. I mean, you can talk about 2019. Yeah, they made it to the playoffs. Yeah, in 21, they made it to the playoffs with Mac Jones. But over the last few years, the offensive personnel decisions, the offensive staffing decisions just leave a lot to be desired. And I don't know. If I am somebody who would, if I were an NFL owner, which obviously I am not, that would want Bill Belichick to be in total control of the franchise. Right. I, Mike Vrabel can come in. We know he can coach today, right? We know that if Derrick Henry is going to leave <laughs> Tennessee, then that's another pretty elite running back, another elite offensive piece. You can probably say, hey, you want to come play for Mike Vrabel again? I bet he'd say, hell yeah, as long as the money's right. So those are things where if I am the Los Angeles Chargers, especially probably I, I might have fallen over myself trying to get to the phone to see if Mike Vrabel want to come. Because the other thing is, Peter, if something happens with Bill Belichick, and I guess we all kind of expect that it does in New England, that's obviously destination number one for Mike Vrabel. He was just inducted into the Patriots Hall of Fame a couple months ago. You know, the Crafts have made no secret that they feel very strongly yeah. about Mike Vrabel. So if you want Mike Grable, you better get to him before the Patriots do. And if I'm Josh Harris with the commanders, I, if, <laughs> frankly, if I'm Mike Grable, I don't think I'm picking up the phone for David Tepper. But if I'm Arthur Blank, you know, those guys like that's some that's a call I've got to make. Miles, let's quickly segue to Belichick and to New England. <clears throat> One of my thoughts about Belichick after uh, his news conference on Monday is very, very simple. He said, I am under contract. He sounded very much like he's willing to be collaborative. I think what he's setting the stage for is to telling, telling Robert Kraft, I'll change my offensive staff. We will move on from Bill O'Brien. We will bring Josh McDaniels back. And I am willing to bring in a general manager. And the big question is, who can run the draft? If he's willing to do that, and you're Robert Kraft, you might think about that. I don't know that Jonathan Kraft would think about it. I think Jonathan Kraft probably really wants to move on. Uh, but it's Robert Kraft, ultimately, who's going to make the decision. 
not his son and club president, uh, Jonathan Kraft. It, it will be a decision that they will make together. But in the end, uh, Robert Kraft is going to make this call. The one thing about this that I think probably at midday Tuesday started in Robert Kraft's head is, you know, even though we still could deal for, uh, even though we still could deal in this position for and make a deal with Mike Vrabel, and it makes more sense to move on, then what are we doing right now? Should we try to cling to the past or do we need to make a clean break? Miles, I don't know for sure what's going to happen, but I believe the Patriots are going to make a clean break, which would mean that the field would include Vrabel, Belichick, and uh, Jim Harbaugh. The one thing I would say about Belichick is he's not going to be for everyone if he's out there. I don't know which owners right now are willing to give him as much power as he is going to want. Okay, that's one thing. I think the one other thing in all of this to consider is if Jim Harbaugh wants to come in, and he does, to me, the job that he would probably feel is the best job out there would be the Los Angeles Chargers. And if, if, because they've got Justin Herbert. And if I am looking at this uh, and I am, uh, you know, the ownership with the Chargers, if I'm Dean Spanos, I think I got to get a younger guy who's won more recently and who's got experience on the offensive side of the ball. So that's, that's kind of what I think. I want to ask you, does it seem to you pretty logical right now? that Vegas stays with Antonio Pierce? Or do you think that they're going to want to sniff around Harbaugh, Belichick, Vrabel? I would bet that Mark Davis wants to sniff around at least Harbaugh and Vrabel. I don't know about Belichick based on the way that everything just went down with Josh McDaniels and, you know, kind of trying to incorporate Patriots West and then it didn't work. And then you have somebody in Antonio Pierce who basically turned everything on its head and made it so much better. But I I don't know if you're really going to get better than Antonio Pierce for that particular team you know the way he just totally embodies being a raider and the way he embraced it you know and and the way he really just molded that team into something that i think is good for the nfl when the raiders are the raiders they felt like the raiders this year I, i i think that mark davis could you know try to sniff around the big fish but really especially after what happened with Rich Bisacci a couple years ago and passing on him and going to McDaniels and all that, and that obviously failed, you probably should just stick with what's in your building. And, you know, you know Antonio Pierce at this point. And I I think that they would – Antonio Pierce has got to have a great plan, you know, to make sure that the offensive philosophy is what he wants it to be, to the defense philosophy, what he wants it to be. But based on what he did this year with a plan that wasn't his – and I, I I find it hard to believe, Peter, that they could do much better. Yeah, I think that Mark Davis probably will sniff around. And look, Antonio Pierce, it's not like he has much leverage. I think he's, he's going to have to wait. Um, and not that there's anything wrong with that. Nobody, I, I always say this about Pro Football Hall of Fame voting. Nobody is going to ask you when you're voting for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. People get upset about this all the time. Hey, were your first ballot guy? I challenge you right now to tell me which ballot, pick a Hall of Famer, which ballot did whoever go in on? Nobody knows that. They just know their bus is in the hall. The only time it's made a big deal of is when a guy like Chris Carter throws a fit when he's not a first ballot Hall of Famer. And, and, and you know, instead of, I, and again, look, I don't want to re-litigate this thing. Instead of just saying, hey, I didn't get in this year. Hopefully I'll get in next year. When you pitch a fit over not being a first ballot Hall of Famer, to me, you're insulting the five guys who that year got in or, or however many got in. I think it's I think it's I think it's poor form, honestly. Anyway, Miles, 
I'm going to give you one opinion about Washington, and then I want you to give me one opinion about Carolina, because neither of us have any idea where either one of those things are going to go. But I'll say this about Washington. I think that Josh Harris, the owner of the Washington Commanders, is so wide open on this process. I was told by somebody there that Josh Harris, and I quote, has absolutely no idea, end quote, who he's going to hire, which is, I think, the best way to go into a coaching search. <clears throat> you go into the search for a GM and a coach, like, okay, let's hear what everybody has to say, and then let's sit down and figure it out. That is a good way to be right now. I have to believe that they could be interested in talking to Bill Belichick, who grew up in nearby Annapolis, uh, is a huge fan of football history. And I think there would be something good in trying to revive a team in the NFC East, um, the Washington Commanders. Give me your two cents on Carolina, because I have absolutely no idea what they'll do. I don't really know what they'll do either, but yeah, I, I suspect it might be a really tough search for them both for yeah. you know somebody to run the football program as GM, president of football operations, whatever you want to call it, and then also for a head coach. I mean, it's not a desirable job based on who you're working for mm -hmm. and the situation, unless you are really in love with Bryce Young and you feel like you can implement a fantastic you know, an offensive philosophy for him, bring in the right kind of guys on the offensive line and to coach the offensive line. That's a really, really tough spot. So this to me is one of those where they might be waiting a while to figure out who exactly they're going to hire, because that's, if you have options, you know, like I said, if you're Mike Vrabel and that phone call comes, I'd, I think I'd rather go, go do television. You know, if there's no other better situation than go to that particular job for this year, because something better is going to open next year than that job. I'm not going to the Carolina Panthers. If I'm any, but any of these guys, I mean, any of the high profile guys anyway, I just, I just don't trust it. I don't trust the owner. I just don't trust it. I like Bryce young. I really do but I just do not trust that organization right now. Miles Simmons, <clears throat> we are now going to segue to our nicer audio and to our nicer sets. And we're going to right now segue to our playoff preview right here on the Peter King podcast. I think this is a really interesting playoff field because I think it could be the year where an upstart not necessarily shocks the world, but surprises the world. And I think there, there are two very interesting teams in the NFC, the Rams and the Packers. And in the AFC, I'm not sure the Steelers can win going up to Buffalo. Uh, and, and, I, and I also think there is, I don't even think you'd call the Browns an upstart team. I, and, and you know, as far as the sixth seed, Miami, I just think Miami's lost too much. Miami goes to Kansas City uh, in the Tyreek Hill revenge game, but the question is, after having struggled on offense so much at times this year, including Sunday night against Buffalo in a game they had to have and couldn't get, um, a team that struggled so much on offense, how is it going to react to playing in zero degree weather, whatever insanely cold night it's going to be in Kansas City. But Miles, I'm gonna give you my upstart team and then I'm gonna ask you for yours and let's just have 30 seconds each on why they're our upstart team. I say the Rams. Not necessarily, I don't necessarily think they will beat Detroit. I just think that's gonna be a great football game and the Rams, this, has nothing to do with the Matthew Stafford, I'll show you game. Matthew Stafford's not mad at the Detroit Lions. He's grateful that he asked the Detroit Lions for a trade and they traded him. So th this is not Matthew Stafford. This is Matthew Stafford coming back to Detroit with love, not with hatred or vengeance, you know? And, but I, I just think 
the Rams interest me so much because of all their rookie and second year player weaponry, both on offense and defense. And I just think they're a fascinating team. And look, if they beat Detroit, they're going to go into San Francisco, probably. They're going to go into San Francisco, and I think that is going to be a hard game for the 49ers. But what say you? Who's your upstart team? Well, I, I, I do like the Rams. Um, and I would say about this matchup, it's not necessarily about, you know, Matthew Stafford going back to Detroit, but there are so many different tentacles within those two organizations, right? I mean, from Brad Holmes, general manager, he came from the Los Angeles Rams and he's got other people who were in that front office that are now in the Detroit front office. So you got those connections. Then of course, Jared Goff, there may not be revenge for Matthew Stafford, but having covered Jared day to day for several years, I know that that dude's got an edge to him. And there's a part of him that would absolutely love to stick it to the Rams and beat them in the postseason, right? And Sean McVay giving up yeah. on him, the organization, all, all these different things. So that's another element of it. So I, I think that's a great game generally. Um, but I, I would turn to the AFC for like an upstart team. And honestly, I would say the Houston Texans. I think they are so dangerous. And Peter, the way that CJ Stroud came out those that absolute bomb to start the game against the Colts, man, that was as impressive as a throw as I've seen this year. I mean, I, I, I you just go back and you drop and you plant your back foot yeah. and you just yak that thing down the field as he did. I mean, and it hits the receiver in stride. I mean, I, it's amazing. And what D'Amico Ryans has done with that team to come out and be a division winner in year one after the absolute slog that that organization has been through over the last several years. I, I, I find it to be really, really impressive. Nick Casario did a great job of also getting Will Anderson, right, after drafting C.J. Stroud. And we don't necessarily talk all that much about Will Anderson, but he's had a really, really solid year as a first-year defensive end. So, you know, <laughs> as somebody who grew up loving watching the Cleveland Browns, man, that I would have rather have seen the Browns play Jacksonville than, you know, having to go to Houston and play C.J. Stroud because, look, well, we saw that Jacksonville, well, they have a lot of flaws, which is why they lost to the Titans. But man, I, I think that when you have a team that is young, and sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And you got D'Amico Ryans, who has experience coaching in the playoffs, not necessarily as a head coach, but obviously with San Francisco, did a lot of things there. That team is dangerous, right? I think they can beat the Browns. I think they can go to Baltimore and keep it very competitive, maybe not win, you know, if that's where they end up going, but they can also do some good things. If Kansas city happens to lose, they got to go to Buffalo. I think they're dangerous there too. So I'm really interested to see how Houston handles things this week. That leads us into our games of the weekend. Okay. There are six games, two Saturday, three Sunday, one Monday night, though. I don't know if that, if Philadelphia Tampa can be called a game I, because Philadelphia is the most collapsible team or the most collapsing team entering the playoffs that there has been in years. Anyway, I want each of us to pick now and I'll start our game of the weekend. And I am going to pick game one of the six, Cleveland at Houston. And look, I think I would say that of all the units on both sides of the ball, when relatively healthy, all the units in the league, there'd be 64 offensive and defensive units combined, okay? Number one right now probably is the Cleveland Browns and on defense. And when I look at the Cleveland Browns on defense, one of the things that I think is that they're going to make it very difficult for C.J. Stroud to have a moment's peace in this game. Their secondary is going to make it difficult. They're banged up a little bit, but their secondary is going to make it difficult <clears throat> to uh, give uh, you know C.J. Stroud a lot of real open looks. So I think that this is going to be a fun game because C.J. Stroud is also 
going to be a huge challenge for the Cleveland Browns in a, you know, a weather controlled atmosphere. I like both of these teams. I love both of their stories. And Miles, I'm going to that game on Saturday. And I'm going to go to two games this weekend. And so I had my choice on Saturday. I either go to Houston to see Cleveland Houston, or you go to see Tua versus Mahomes in prime time. And most people would say, geez, it's a, you know, you want to go see Cleveland and Houston, you know, this 5 4 matchup, all that. And I just said, damn right I do. They're new, they're interesting. They're kind of fascinating stories. Whoever wins that game is really an interesting story. And I'm not saying, I, I think uh, Miami at Kansas City could be very, very interesting with Tyreek Hill going back, the Dolphins coming off such a downer of a game, the Dolphins trying to find pass rush from somewhere. But I think I'm most fascinated by Cleveland at Houston. What's your game? Well, Peter, I know why you don't want to go to Kansas City. It's supposed to be a low, a minus nine down there on Saturday. So I wouldn't really want to go there either. <laughs> no, uh, you know what, though? I'm actually going to pick the game that you just said may not be a game because I'm endlessly fascinated by it. And, like, you know, we kind of talked about the Rams and, and Lions, and I could pick that, and I am really interested in that one. But I'm telling you, Eagles, Bucks. This is a strange matchup because these two teams have basically Very. limped into the playoffs. I mean, it's weird, right? You get the Bucks. All they needed to do was have a good showing. They could have beaten the Saints at home and they would have clinched the division right then. And then they could have done whatever they needed to do against the Carolina Panthers in week 18, but they lost to the Saints. Right. They did not play very well. Baker Mayfield gets broke up a little bit and then they go to Charlotte. And I watched all that game, Peter. They did not look very good against the Carolina Panthers defensively. Yeah, they, they had a great game, but everybody has a great game defensively against the Carolina Panthers, unless you're the Green Bay Packers, apparently. So that to me is why this is so fascinating. You've got two teams that are not playing well, right? You got Baker Mayfield who has not played well over the last couple of weeks. He's dealing with injury and you've got the Eagles who have just absolutely fallen apart. I don't know who's going to win this game. I don't know what this game is going to look like. And that's part of why I'm so fascinated by it. Because if the Bucks offense can just get a little bit going, right, against that defense, which has not been very good, no matter who's calling the plays or coordinating it, what have you, then we can really see the Bucks get into the divisional round. I don't necessarily think they do very well in the divisional round, but I don't really think the Eagles would do very well in the divisional round either. So this is kind of this weird matchup between two teams that really need to bounce back in some way. One of the teams will win, and I am just really fascinated to see who it's going to be. Miles, I'm going to end segment one of the podcast with my... I'm just saying, note of the playoffs. Okay. And I'm just saying that Mike McCarthy better not lose to the Green Bay Packers. Because mm -hmm. Jerry Jones has already said, well, let's see what happens in the playoffs when asked about the job security of his head coach. So I'm just saying, and I've said this for a long time, if Bill Belichick is on the street, Remember 21 years ago, everybody said, oh, why is Jerry talking to Bill Parcells? Parcells will never go work for Jerry. This just in, he did. And even if you ask Parcells off the record these days, he'll say, I enjoyed working for Jerry, because he did. Anyway, we are going to take a short break, and then we're going to be back with the back half of the podcast. And we're going to have these topics. The Josh Allen experience. I am all in, baby. Then we're going to discuss one award. We're not going to go through them all. We're going to go discuss one award. We're going to go a little bit in depth on Defensive Player of the Year, which to me is the impossible selection. And then we're going to cap the Peter King podcast with who's right and who's wrong, Jameis, Allen, Jameis Winston or Dennis Allen. So... Take a short break. Miles Simmons and I will be back on the Peter King Podcast.
Back on the podcast, Miles, you probably know I was in Miami Gardens, Florida on Sunday night. I covered Miami's loss to the Buffalo Bills. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say just two things about the state of each one of these teams. The Miami Dolphins started this game by intercepting Josh Allen twice in the red zone. Then they recovered a fumble when Christian Wilkins basically stole the ball from Josh Allen. And that came just after Josh Allen, toward the end of the first half, ended a drive with no timeouts and no time left on the clock by throwing the ball short of the end zone. And the Bills ended the first half at the one-yard line without the ability to even kick a field goal. With all those things having happened, the Buffalo Bills still won the game. Miami's offense sputtered and started. Tua Tagovailoa threw a terrible interception into double coverage at a vital time in the second half to Bill Safety Taylor Rapp. And so I'm not really high on the Dolphins coming into the playoffs. In addition, they will have none of their top four pass rushers that they started the season with, and that's after Andrew Van Ginkle uh, was lost almost certainly for this weekend uh, with a foot injury against Buffalo. I I can't figure out how they're going to play well and win that game in Kansas City, but then again, that is why they play the games. I want to talk about the Bills for a moment. Spent some time with Josh Allen five minutes maybe after the game. And we talked a little bit about the Josh Allen experience. And he said, I want the ball in my hands at the end of every game. And that's what it comes down to. You saw how he converted the third and 13 with a run. That reminds me of, you know, if you're the star of your high school team and you're the quarterback and you've got to score a touchdown, you got to convert. What do you do? Coach calls in a play, whatever the play is. You say, okay, I got that. And then you just simply take the ball and you run for it because you know you're the best player on your team and you trust yourself to make that play. And that's who Josh Allen is right now. And of course he converted third and 13 by barreling out there. Uh, And and that is what you're going to get with the Buffalo Bills. I'm in for that though because I think he's so talented and I think he's so smart. He does take some risks. But I do think here's a guy who I really trust to win late in games. I don't think they're going to have a huge problem with Pittsburgh. You never know. But I like the Josh Allen experience heading into the playoffs. What say you? I think they would have more of a problem with Pittsburgh if TJ Watt were really going to be available and healthy. And it certainly doesn't look like that's going to be the case. I mean, the Josh Allen turnovers are always the thing that bothers me. But you're right that when the game is on the line, He's the guy that you want to have the ball. You know, you were saying that it reminded me of when I was playing high school football and we had a a best player like that. And there was a game where he was running for touchdowns. I think he might've thrown for a touchdown and he took this kickback toward the end of the game, like 96 yards for touchdown. We needed to go down and score. And in the local paper, they wrote, you know, he would have driven the bus home too. If he had his CDL, right? That's the kind of player Josh Allen is. It absolutely (laughs) is. He will drive the bus. Right. And that's the kind of guy that, like you said, like he said, like you said, you want him to have the ball in his hands because at a certain point, he's just going to make a play. That third and 13 run was absolutely unbelievable. And as soon as he took off, I'm like, man, he's going to get this. It doesn't matter how many guys are going to be in his way. He's going to find a way. That's the thing I respect about Josh Allen. He does tend to find a way. However, when you throw interceptions, right, when you are just kind of trying to make a player, when you lose the football, when you're on a sack, Those are the kinds of things that can really doom you against better teams. And I thought Miami was a better team, right? Miami, I felt lost this game on offense. When you don't score anything in the second half, you can't move the ball, right? They had one first down until their final drive on offense in the entire second half. And it was tongue of Iloa throwing inaccurate passes. Tyreek Hill drops one, you know, Braxton Berrios doesn't necessarily run the route, maybe at the right depth or whatever it happens to be, but he can't spin out of a tackle. I mean, you're not getting the plays. You're not doing enough. 
That's to me why the Miami Dolphins lost that game. And you allowed Josh Allen to be able to take over and drive the bus. So I'm really disappointed in Miami. I understand that they're dealing with injuries. And if they don't have guys like a Jalen Waddle, like a Mostert, like, you know, a Xavier Howard too. I mean, I, it's hard for me, even as bad as Kansas city has looked throughout the course of the season, really hard for me to see them going into, you know, sub zero wind chill and playing a really competitive game with the Kansas city chiefs. I mean, the only way that happens is if Kansas city turns the ball over or they can't drop or they just keep dropping passes, which, you know, that could certainly happen too. So miles, another bad segue by me. I'm going to talk for a minute about defensive player of the year. Um, and so I've been doing, I've been one of the voters for the Associated Press postseason awards for a long time. I don't know how many years, but over the years, every year, there are some hard choices to make. And I'm not saying this is the hardest choice to make, but this defensive player of the year vote is going to be exceedingly difficult this year. And I'll just put a, a little exclamation point about why. So I try to look at analytics and stats and, and um, ru- you know, time to rush the quarterback, things like that, some of the modern things. So I've been gathering some statistical data over the last 24 hours, knowing that I've got to make this decision I'll cast my vote sometime this week to the Associated Press. And I'll just, I'll underline how this is so tough. Pro Football Focus uh, is one of the groups that does pressures, quarterback hits, hurries, sacks, things like that. And in overall pressures, which is sacks, hits, and hurries, overall pressures after this season... Miles Garrett of the Cleveland Browns has 86. TJ Watt of the Pittsburgh Steelers has 86. And that just underlines how difficult a decision this is, uh, along with the fact that Micah Parsons has 103. And so it, there's a lot of things that will go into this. But on the surface, and I and believe me, you have to consider Nick Bosa. You have to consider Max Crosby. I think there are five borderline incredible candidates this year. And I don't know which way I'm going to go right now. My eyes from watching the year, my eyes really favor Miles Garrett. Um, and one play just stands out in my mind. And it's not a sack. It's not a quarterback pressure. It's when he jumped over the center at Indianapolis and smothered a field goal attempt. And first of all, uh, the leap in that thing was ridiculous. And to then smother the field goal, it just... I just think Miles Garrett is special, but you know what? I think TJ Watt's special too. I love Parsons. So I don't know. Miles, I'm not saying make my decision for me, but Miles, make my decision for me. Well, you know, I, when you said what you said about your eyes, right. And I think that sometimes that's just what we've got to go by because statistics tell us different things. And if we were going to go off pure numbers, then I don't know that anybody would really choose Lamar Jackson for MVP, right? But our eyes tell us when we watch the games, Lamar Jackson is the best player in the league this year. I mean, and and if you watch it and you see it, there's absolutely no doubt about that. So I don't see any problem with going with your eyes there. You know, I think that Miles Garrett has to fight through so much just to try to make one play, right? And you can say, oh, the sack numbers aren't there and it's this and it's that. And that's not everything. I think when you go into pressures and you see what he's done, what TJ Watts done, as you cited Micah Parsons and all these different guys, you know, they make incredible plays on a down to down basis. And so you could use that. You could say, well, Micah Parsons was the best defensive player on a team that 
ended up with the two seed, right? And that means that he may have had more of an impact in some way. But then you look at the Cleveland Browns and you say, well, that team won 11 games. And you go through four quarterbacks that won games, right? Five, if you count everybody that started with Jeff Driscoll on Sunday. And you're saying, well, you know, how else did they do that aside from really great defense? And who leads that defense? But Miles Garrett, TJ Watt, 19 sacks. I mean, that's ridiculous. And what he does on a play-to-play basis, down-to-down basis. Like I said, they're going up to Buffalo. They don't have that guy. Man, that really diminishes their chances. So I understand why anybody would vote for TJ Watt too. So this is one of those where I'm like, you know, if you get one guy over the other, like, am I really going to be that mad about it? I don't, I don't think so, because I think that there are many deserving candidates this year. What's interesting is one of the other things I one of the other things I looked at is how they played down the stretch. Mm-hmm. Um, when the Cleveland Browns are playing for the playoffs, when the when the Pittsburgh Steelers are playing for the playoffs, and that's one of the reasons why I hesitate sometimes to to put as much stock in sacks as many people do. And here's yeah. the reason why. In the last four games of the season that he played, last four games, Miles Garrett had 35 pressures. And he had one sack. So you can, a critic might say, well, geez, he's not getting home, so to speak. But he's affecting the quarterback on nine Pass drops every game down the stretch when they're playing for the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I I can't get that one out of my head. And and I forget TJ Watts 21, 22. I forget how many he is. It's 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 good. It's very good. But that really kind of impacts me a little bit. We'll see how we vote, but I just wanted to try to give people a sense of of how difficult a selection that is because look I watched TJ Watt in that game uh, you know the in Baltimore in absolutely miserable conditions and in the span of I think he played 38 minutes or 36 minutes something like that but he got hurt you know he hurt his knee late in that game you know in the in the miserable rain freezing rain of of Baltimore but he was totally impactful in that game and I just I dread honestly turning in my vote because I'm going to say were you right or were you not right um I I shouldn't say I dread I don't dread I'm going to make the best decision I can so we'll leave it at that Miles I want to cap the pod this week with something that I never thought in a million years that we would be talking about. For those who did not see the play, the New Orleans Saints um, finished the season against the Atlanta Falcons. And in that game, essentially, the New Orleans Saints kind of obliterated the Falcons. And, and at the end of the game, the New Orleans Saints were in victory formation, which everybody knows. It's everybody huddled around the quarterback who's going to just take a snap and take a knee. You know, you've only got seconds left in the game, and it's 41 to 17. Everybody thinks that Jameis Winston, who's in the game at that time, is going to take the snap, kneel, everybody goes home. But he doesn't do that. And a little bit of homework on this. Uh, The New Orleans Saints this year, and for those who know Jamal Williams, he's a running back. He was in Detroit last year, scored 17 rushing touchdowns, and he was a wildly popular guy on the Lions. He left in free agency and went to the Saints. And he hadn't scored a touchdown the whole year. And the Saints love this guy, love Jamal Williams. And so Jameis Winston took it upon himself 
to say we're going to line up in victory formation. I'm going to hand the ball to Jamal Williams, and he's going to score. The Atlanta-New Orleans rivalry is really kind of an FU rivalry. They hate each other. Yep. But when you saw this play, you say that was really Bush League by the New Orleans Saints to do that. And you saw the aftermath of the game when Arthur Smith, the about-to-be-fired uh, coach of the Atlanta Falcons, walks across the field and he is spewing venom the whole way. What kind of BS was that? That is ridiculous. And Dennis Allen under knows that it was ridiculous. At the moment, he doesn't even know what happened, why it happened. But afterwards, Jameis Winston said, that was a, quote, team decision. And the team decision was to give Jamal Williams a touchdown because he hadn't had one the whole year. Miles Simmons, my first reaction to that was, that is a very bad thing for Dennis Allen because his team went over the coach's head. And anytime you do that, even for something that appears to be borderline harmless, I think it's very bad for the head coach because it shows, does he really have, is he really in charge of this team? Or is this a player-run team? And I don't mean in a good way. How did you see it? And how do you look at it right now? Well, I wasn't watching that game live. So when you hear, oh, the, the, the Saints scored a late touchdown and then Arthur Smith was mad, you're kind of like, well, stop them. You know, what, what do you mean? And then you hear, well, they were in victory formation and then they actually ran a play out of victory formation. And you're like, oh, no, that's wrong. Right. That's when you are in yeah. victory formation, you are signaling to the defense, hey, <clears throat> it's over. I've given up. It's a white flag. And there are some things within player safety where you could say if a defense is not prepared for the people on offense to fire off the ball, right? And for a running back to start coming at you, that's a player safety issue. That's wrong. So the fact that Jameis Winston did that and made the team decision, whatever you want to call it, like that's, it's not the right thing to do. And I understand wanting to get Jamal Williams a touchdown. And if they lined up in, I don't know, uh, an offset eye, and then they run that play, then you're not at least signaling to the defense. Hey, we're not, we're, we're not running a play here. Like if you signal that you're running a play, that it is what it is. But the fact that they did that out of victory formation is the thing that bothers me the most about it. Because when you are in victory formation, that means I'm not running a play. So I, first of all, like, you know, I know you were saying that last week on, on PFT live that, you know, if you have two players reporting like that should be an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. This to me is another one that should be an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. You don't run a play out of victory formation. So I don't know if it really means that Dennis Allen has lost the team or not. I don't like it from Jameis Winston. If I am Dennis Allen, there's a part of me that might want to cut Jameis Winston over something like this. Um, because he's the quarterback and ultimately he calls a play and he decides what to do with the ball. But this was not a good look from the saints, you know? And I, I think that when you do something like that, I understand the frustration from Arthur Smith. I do, because uh, again, it, it eventually gets to a player safety issue rather than just if, if they lined up in I formation and they hand it off to Jamal Williams, and he gets into the end zone. That's, that's way different to me than being in victory formation and signaling the game is over. Yeah, I don't like it for a lot of different reasons. I don't care how adamant or how strong your rivalry is. Um, it was not a good way to end the game for the Saints. Um, and all the people, I've seen a hundred people in the media, uh, many of them former players, supporting Jameis Winston and say, what a great teammate. I love that guy. It was Bush League, period. That's all there is to it. It was Bush League. You don't run up the score to get a phony touchdown for a guy. How good does that touchdown feel to Jamal Williams? Really? Probably it's a phony good. touchdown. It's like, know, it's like, you, you know, it's a phony <laughs> touchdown. It is, but you get, it's, it's hard to get a touchdown. touchdown. It's hard to get into the end zone unless, you know, you're saying we're not running a play. 
<laughs> no, no, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a phone. It is so a phony touchdown. It's a phony. It's a phony touchdown because mm. it's like when the other team is letting you score. Yes. You know, when the other team lays down and lets you score, that's what yeah. this was. How good do you feel about the touchdown, Jamal Williams? Mm. So I think, I, 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 hey, look, we're pretty much in agreement that this was yeah. a horse crap thing to do, in it my was. opinion, for a lot of reasons. Anyway, yeah. that is the end of this week's Peter King podcast. It was kind of a rollicking podcast, probably a little bit longer than usual. Hope you enjoyed it. And we will see you back next week for another episode of the pod in which we will dissect Wild Card Weekend. There's no preface to Wild Card Weekend. There's no adjective to Wild Card Weekend. It's Wild Card Weekend. And we'll be back next week to dissect that and to look ahead to the divisional round. Thanks a lot for being with us, Miles. Thank you. And we'll see you all again next week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.